soda. It's everywhere. You can't escape it. It's the real goddamn thing. Like rats in New York or failed actors in LA, most human beings are rarely more than a few feet from a can of this caramelized corn gravy. But what is soda? Soda is a drink, carbonated and flavored with a variety of ingredients and usually sweetened with sugar, also known as death salt. Soda is dispersed from fountains, sold in bottles and cans, and in movie tie-in merchandise. While what they produce is nothing more than sugar-blasted tap water, soda companies inspire deep, emotional ties to their products. Globally, the Coca-Cola logo is a better recognized symbol than the crucifixion. What? Don't look at me like that. It's not my fault you don't come in cherry flavor. While today soda is known for its tooth eroding, waistline widening properties, it began life as a medicinal product. In the 1800s, soda fountains were a ubiquitous feature of drugstores and pharmacies in America. Behind the bar, you'd find a soda jerk, what they were actually called, who would pump carbonated water into a menagerie of dubious but delicious medical ingredients. But it turned out that people really enjoyed the mouth massage offered by these bubbly broths, and so soda fountains became a battleground of competing flavors. But everything changed in 1886, when a man named John Doc Pemberton invented French wine coca, later renamed Coca-Cola. Pemberton was an Atlanta pharmacy owner and a former Confederate soldier, who'd bought a dubious $5 medical license so that he could call himself a doctor. Initially, his recipe included both alcohol and cocaine, also known as argument powder. But Pemberton himself was more partial to morphine, dying while addicted two years after he invented his signature drink. But the Coca-Cola company prefers to focus on the drink's down-home country origins. Like in this nostalgic promotional film, featuring old duck Pemberton the gentleman smackhead mixing his cocaine-laced booze broth with what looks like a rowing oar. It took 17 years and an enforcement of local prohibition laws before Coca-Cola lost both booze and cocaine from its recipe. But in that time, it built a small, loyal following of frenzied tweakers. But Coca-Cola's first real step to global domination came with a pioneering ad campaign. Representatives of the company would go to the most popular soda fountains in town, find who their most loyal customers were, and then send these cereal soda chuggers coupons for their brand inspiring emotional loyalty before that in chemical dependency do the rest. The company was so successful that it inspired an army of cola clones to bubble to the surface, including Brad's Drink, later renamed Pepsi Cola in 1898 to capitalize on the cola craze. In order to stand out from their new competitors, Coca-Cola gave every bottle they produced a distinctive pair of childbearing hips, so even a blind person would be able to recognize a bottle of their brown, fizzy migraine soup. Today, marketing is still utterly integral to how these brands maintain their vicious chokehold on the nation's collective neck pipes. In 2018, Coca-Cola's marketing budget was an absurd $5.8 billion, which is nearly double the yearly GDP of Barbados. And Pepsi isn't far behind, spending $4.3 billion in the same year. Big Soda's propaganda departments use these bloated budgets to buy up any form of eye real estate that you might associate with a good time. This can involve plastering their logos onto the foreheads of every stadium in the world, or it can be more subtle, something like product placement. And I'm sure you guys are far too sophisticated to be swayed by these kinds of propaganda campaigns. Your minds are as clear and refreshing as an ice cold can of Cran Raspberry LaCroix. Ah, LaCroix. It tastes like having fruit described to you. Fuck you. Coca-Cola steadily increased their sales over the first half of the 20th century, but their Turd Reich truly took off in the Second World War. The company made a deal with the US Army. In exchange for an exception in sugar rationing, they promised to provide every soldier a refreshing bottle of Coca-Cola for no more than a nickel. And this was a win-win for Coca-Cola. Not only did it protect its overheads, but it also allowed them to scatter bottling plants everywhere that American GIs were scattering limbs. Coca-Cola dominated the soda markets for decades after World War II, so Pepsi had to bide its time before marketing its drink to a new generation. The right one, the modern light one, now it's Pepsi, for those who think young. Pepsi belongs to your generation. Coca-Cola responded to Pepsi's threat and produced one of the most iconic adverts of all time. From this point on, all big soda companies followed the Catholic Church School of Marketing. 
Get them while they're young and they'll never forget you. Today, big soda companies will make a big song and dance about not advertising directly to anyone under the age of 12. But anyone that's lived longer than a dozen sun cycles? Well, let's see how a former marketing executive at Coca-Cola puts it. Well, let me be really clear. Um, as a marketer at Coca-Cola, I was specifically, uh, I was never told not to market to kids. It just was not done overtly. Now, I can get to, um, um, as soon as they turn 12, you know, I'm like a rabid dog on a, on a something. Selling to preteens is a huge part of Fat Soda's marketing strategy, which is probably why Pepsi hired the number one expert in preteen persuasion to be their spokesperson in the 1980s. The smooth criminal himself seen here grooming a gang of street kids to slurp down Pepsi's sticky syrup. Pepsi might have secured the king of pop, but in the same era, Coca-Cola ran this campaign with the king of popping pills. Because who wouldn't want to share a glass of suspicious fizzy liquid with Bill Cosby? Ready to drink. Coca-Cola, now. Coke These youth focus campaigns have been the cornerstone of Fat Soda's marketing strategy ever since, and it clearly works. Between 2011 and 2014, two-thirds of children in America drank one sugary drink a day, and 30% of them drank two or more. In many markets, it still outsells water substantially. So how did this overconsumption begin? Hey, 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 All I want is a Pepsi. From the early 1980s to the early 2000s, the soda industry experienced its golden age. Two decades of a continuous rise in both production and consumption. Rotund Soda achieved this partly by expanding to more international markets. But their smartest move wasn't getting more people to drink soda, it was getting them to drink more of it. And they did this by slowly normalizing the consumption of their products by the fucking bucketful. This was how Pepsi advertised their new large 12 ounce bottle in the 1960s, designed to be shared between three people. Next time you have lots of people around, have lots of Pepsi half quarts around. The one that pours three big servings for three big thirsts. Less than 20 years later, 7-Eleven, America's favorite public toilet, were advertising the 32 ounce Big Gulp, meant to be choked down by a single, probably quite sad individual. They first served it up with this slogan in 1982. But 7-Eleven's Big Gulp gives you another kind of freedom, freedom of choice. What they don't tell you though, is that that choice is between an extra large or king size coffin. Oh. Peak soda consumption arrived in 1999, reaching 50 gallons per person per year. That's enough for every man, woman and child in America to take a bath in the stuff, provided they can fit in the tub. This level of consumption was nearly double what it was in 1980 when this 20 year cold streak began. And by a sheer and total coinky dink, the other thing that doubled in this time was global obesity rates. A connection that Big Soda pays good money to divert your attention from, as these companies are responsible for more misinformation than they are diabetic amputations. Rotund Soda's war on facts began in 1961. Like in this advert, where a Stepford wife tells you that Coke actually keeps you skinny. Ice cold Coca-Cola. There's no waistline worry with Coke, you know. And even then, this is probably about as convincing as a YouTuber doing an ad read for Raid Shadow Legends. Oh, and remember, Coke is low in calories too. Say now, don't you get any thinner? Between 2011 and 2015, Coca-Cola and Pepsi funded a total of 86 national health organizations. What these companies get in exchange for this funding is an army of shills, I mean scientists, who will give paid lectures attesting to the fact that soda isn't really that bad for you, even though the scientific consensus is the opposite. Until very recently, Coca-Cola and Pepsi were the primary funders of the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, the world's largest body of food and nutrition experts. Which is a bit like finding out the world's largest women's rights organization is funded by Ted Bundy. And the Coca-Cola Foundation have said that a third of their philanthropic spending goes towards countering obesity. All this philanthropy is a marketing strategy in disguise. A strategy that nutrition experts who aren't in the pockets of Big Soda call health washing. Or what I like to call the Marty McFly School of Sucker Punch Distraction. Now, I'm gonna... whoa, whoa, Biff, what's that? <laughs> Fat Soda only funds organizations, studies, and individuals who can help them shift the blame from consumption 
onto exercise as the solution to the obesity crisis. And this same pattern is also behind Fat Soda's ludicrous spending on sports sponsorship. Coca-Cola has been the sponsor of the Olympic Games since 1928 and has been the sponsor of the World Cup since the late 70s. So when these events aren't displaying the achievements of professional ball chasers and doped up Russian supermen, they are selling you soda, building a strong association between these products and athletic excellence. And it's not just events and locations, the sporting world's favourite meat vessels are also fair game. When LeBron James isn't working as a mouthpiece for the Chinese government, he's shilling for America's own red menace. Having signed a six-year endorsement deal with Coca-Cola worth $16 million, sports celebrities perform two functions for soda companies. They help inspire emotional loyalty in fans, and they help insinuate the idea that soda drinking at least isn't incompatible with healthy living. How can our drinks possibly make you fat? We're friends with all the people who chase ball for money. But there is good news. In 2017, bottled water sales outstripped soda for the first time. Which, granted, is still bad for the earth, but it is better for your continued presence on it. People are increasingly aware that even a moderate soda habit substantially increases the risk of obesity, type 2 diabetes, and cardiovascular disease. But knowledge isn't going to stop what soda companies are best at bypassing your logic center and aiming straight for your weakened, sugar-sped heart. Like in this 2011 Reasons to Believe campaign, in which a group of suspiciously normal-sized children sing Oasis and remind us that, hey, we might live in a world full of missiles and people getting pushed into threshing machines, but at least there's lots of cuddly little teddy bears. It's a very well-made advert, but its info is a little bit outdated, so I've decided to update it with a few stats of my own. Oh hi, didn't see you there. I'd just like to take this opportunity to thank all 50 of my very generous patrons. You guys keep ordinary things going and you keep me in delicious LaCroix. If you want to become a patron, check out my Patreon at the link below or wherever it is. All right, now fuck off. <laughs>